Good morning. Is there anybody there? <clears throat> Hi, Des. Hello, Z. <clears throat> All right, Ryan. Hello. How are you doing? Excellent. Hi, Brad. All right, so still on the mission to hit 21 ideas. I don't know how many we've got so far. I think we should have a look, really. Um, okay, I'll tell you what as well. I'm going to adjust the logo. Let's get it up a bit. There we go. That's better, isn't it? Um. <clears throat> uh, Hi there, Danny. Okay, let's have a look at the machine. Like, the most important thing. All right, here we are. Right. Uh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen. 14, 15, 16. 16, right, we've got 16. I need another five. Okay. <clears throat> I've got Saturday and Sunday, though. Um, right. Let's keep going. It still doesn't feel enough in there. Uh, <clears throat> so, I had, oh, right, yes. So, unfortunately, oh, hi, Gramps. Right, seven thirty-seven. That's a reasonable. Oh, and PM. That's a that's a nice time, isn't it? To be watching this show. Excellent. No, good good to have you here. Right. Um what was I doing? What was I saying? Oh yeah. Splurging, right. So we need to make another four ideas. Uh I had to do a template update yesterday because uh after every every session I do, right? Especially uh when there's a lot of splurging going on, uh, is I do wins, problems and opportunities. Now, for those of you who don't really know about this process, uh it is super important, right? Um so firstly the reason I do like a win is uh when when you're sitting in a session like this and actually experience this when you're playing on guitar, especially when you're improvising, playing live. Uh, when we're actually in the moment, when we're in self two, which I'll talk about quite a bit as well, self two being um, the self that, uh, you know, that's basically there for performance. Uh, we can have interference from self one, which is the editor and the uh, critique. Okay. So it's kind of like two parts of us um, in the process, the critical self um, uh, that that psychologists will call negative site. Like, what's it? The negative um, narrative will happen with self one. So the critic, uh, self two, self two is what you want. What you want to be in when you're doing stuff like this. So self two is all about being in the moment, the performance. Um, you'll feel like you're making decisions effortlessly. Okay, but what we can do is we can be overcritical. Um, in our sessions and sometimes it's uh, well not sometimes most of the time it's very difficult to really rely on your feelings based on something so this is why um, I have the machine because it kind of removes all of that self-doubt thing okay so um, 
you know, I mean, sometimes I will have an amazing session, you know, and I'll just feel great after it. Sometimes it'll be like, oh, I'm not really sure about that. Don't know what I was doing. I think I was making a load of rubbish, right? But one of the rules is on the machine is that we're kind of creating ideas and we are putting them in the splurge column because what's happening here is, um, apart from the sketchbook here, is this is mirroring converging, divergent thinking. Um, over the over the entire creative process so we're divergently thinking everything is um, possible here on this splurge thing so what we don't want to be doing uh, when we're in our session is thinking into the future we just want to be absolutely in the now uh, because what actually happens is when we're thinking ahead we become result focused and if we're result focused we're not actually thinking on what's supposedly happening and this is where we start listening to our thoughts and if you're listening to your thoughts you're not actually listening to the music that you're working on so it does take a little bit of um, mental practice to overcome this but we have a machine there and one of the rules is is when we make these ideas is uh, you don't listen to them for seven days so you can get that kind of distance um, the minimum is like three days yeah, I mean, obviously, there's just times, you know, you might have a deadline so you can just knock something through the machine really rapidly or you might find something you, you're just quite happy in your session doing your splurge and you think, you know what, I'll just continue with this. Well, I mean, that's fine as well. And you'll end up with something, you know, possibly in draft or done, um, even finished. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of like what what's happening there, but we don't need to be, um, you know, we don't have to take our thoughts and feelings that are happening now as the absolute truth. So there's been many a time where I've been writing stuff and thinking, this is just awful, I hate it. And then I listen back after three, seven days, and I think, you know what, that's a really good idea. But I do remember actually it being, you know, rubbish. So um, at the end of every session, I do wins, problems, and opportunities. And even if you're having a rubbish, rubbish session, uh, you know, I make myself come up with something that's positive there is always something positive uh that you can that you can come up with and the important thing about having your win and having that positive thing when you review your sessions is it just opens your mind to learning when you're in that kind of negative state it's very difficult to then um uh take heed of all the possible options that you've got but the best part of this process um, is problems okay and uh, problems are just brilliant so after you've done your wins you've got your problems I mean this process has totally helped me and it's so simple with just playing guitar again and you know getting back into the shred um, doing economy picking uh, you know it, it's been the one thing that's really pushed me along and uh, for example you know I'll do wins problems and opportunities uh, after every live session with Thomas um, and after every live session I do on guitar and I would just write down you know what went well with the you know using sorry economy picking and then what could I improve on what sort of uh, and then you know writing the things down to do with the problems when I come to the problems I would identify all the problems that I was having and then come up with specific exercises to overcome that and when you start coming up with options based off the problems everything gets very exciting you know you realize oh I've got a roadmap and I've got a plan here and I've got something you know I can work on now and it's just the same with music production you know um, at times we don't see this Ableton Live here, it's like lots of stuff going on on the screen, isn't it? But we don't necessarily see that as an instrument, but it is an instrument and it is something that we can practice just in the same way. And um, by finding out what the problems are, okay, and then coming up with solutions and options for those problems, what we do is we create new knowledge for ourselves. And if we create new knowledge for ourselves, then we're obviously moving forward. And um, just be, by doing that process, right, you know, totally trust me 100% on this. If you start doing, every time you play in your guitar, right, every time you're writing a bit of music, right, you do your wins, problems and opportunities, right, okay, and then you do something when you've got your opportunities about it, you will improve, you know. What I would say, though, is when you're doing in particular, I mean, a lot of this I'll free write as well. So uh, this is another important bit of it. So... You know, if I'm un unsure about stuff, I'll just start free writing. Now, free write, there's a brilliant book called Accidental Genius, which I can't remember the guy, uh, but this is where I got free writing from. And actually, free writing uh, is where the splurge kind of thing comes from as well. Um, 
what free writing's about is, if you think about it, our brains are making um, unconscious decisions for us. It, they're still deciding on things that we're not necessarily aware of. So this thing is kind of going underneath the level, all right, of what we're conscious of, what we're aware of, okay? Now, what free writing does is it allows us uh, to get under that um, level of consciousness and really get down to the good stuff, um, you know, all the interesting stuff and what, what really could be good, okay? And the way to do that in the free write is you just start writing okay unedited you're not worrying about structured sentences you're not worried about like how neat your handwriting is or anything like that okay you just you know wins problems opportunities you're just splurting it all out so i might be i might go into this exercise right and what a stupid pointless exercise is i can't be bothered I just want to get back in the studio write some music or go out and have a run you know but then eventually what happens is it takes cr- traction and then i start writing like lots of stuff about the session okay and then i'll find the wins and then it'll lead on to the, then i'll prompt myself with the problems and then i'll start free writing on all the problems okay um, and then when i get to that then i'll start writing free writing about possible solutions and really there is nothing off the table everything is you know good i read through the options okay and then i just make a list right of actual actions it is a musical free write. That's exactly what it is, see. Because we're trying to get down to the good stuff. And and this is what happens. It's like, you know, you'll start writing stuff and you go, wow, that's good. Is that me? You know, you stop recognizing yourself almost, you know, because you just have to go for wild stuff. And the more, the more splurging you do, um, you know, the better it can get, especially when you're under pressure. Like, I really like those, you know, I'm really strict about the 10-minute splurges. A lot of the time, something, there'll be one thing in that that's a bit weird and unusual, and that's what you want. I mean, we're here to make uh, unique music, not music the same as everybody else, really. Um, you know, we're trying to push the envelope in our chosen genre to to try and make something a little bit different because there is so much well-produced, well-mixed uh, crap music out there you know it's a fire hydrant of of music being splashed out uh across beatport across spotify across tidal across amazon you know uh, everybody's releasing music but the one thing we need to do is we do need to come up with something unique it's, it's very difficult you know but by doing something like the machine by writing lots of splurging it means we can kind of fast forward to the good bits isn't it and then have some music right that we're working on that may give us a chance of you know having something slightly different i mean you know the machine for me has been brilliant it came up with sort of my whole style for like synth wave well i say synth wave but it's really to me it's like electronic music because like i mix so many genres inward um i probably couldn't you know it's kind of electronic really to, to be honest so yes, that uh, that splurging is is without a doubt a hundred percent a musical free write, and we're completely in the process, and we've been non-judgmental of what we're doing. At least we're trying to do that, and we're not focusing into the future. We're not focus. We're not giving ourselves expectation. Okay, uh, what we're doing is we are completely in the now, and just dealing with what's there. Expectation isn't a great thing because I mean. When we start having an expectation of something, um, this is where you know you'll you you know you come in from an evening out, right? You start making music, okay, and you just think, oh, this is an absolutely amazing banger of a tune. I can't wait to work on this tomorrow. And then uh, you get up, and then you listen to it, right? And then you think, God, what was I thinking of? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that, and one of them is is you made this piece of music that is unfinished, and then you start projecting possible futures for it okay and then when you wake up with fresh ears the next day the problem is is it's not matching up to what your future expectation was so there's that there's also the fact that like our thoughts and opinions change constantly and the phenomenon of recorded music right okay and the mismatch between it and us is the fact that it's recorded and it's not changing ever so that music's not changing, but you're changing. And depending on what you've listened to or 
whatever you've been doing or what your influence or what conversations you've been having with your friends or whatever they're listening to or whatever's come on the car radio uh, and your atten- and it grabs your attention even in the subconscious it can lead you to this thing of like I'm not working on that again when you learn a process like the the machine like this when you learn this process uh, because in each of these, it's not just a list of columns. This uh, what actually happens is um, so when I coach on this, the, there are um, I wouldn't call them exercises, but there are kind of games that you play, which are designed to get you unstuck. You know, if you're stuck, um, these things will get you up and give you new, fresh perspectives. But also the games that you play within here cause um, are designed to cause problems that you have to solve. Uh, and by solving them you create new knowledge and that way you become like one of these producers that you've always got an answer to something you've always got a suggestion to do there's always something to try out um so we don't have to focus on on future expectation because actually the machine takes that away we've clearly got multiple ideas here okay that, that are moving through the creative process. So discovery is the investigation on an idea from splurge. If you hear something you're interested, let's do an investigation. It's a splurge on a splurge. Draft is draft's pretty much what it says, uh, but potentially you're trying to work at that point. If you haven't got a purpose, you're thinking, well, what is the purpose here? And then you're making that purpose happen, and the purpose is the story. Uh, but it's also not just the story, it's the arc and the overall structure. Uh Done is like a place you just hold music, decide whether you're going to release it. Once you're going to release it, then from done into release, you do everything that you need to do um, to get it to release, and then, you know, it gets released. So the beauty of this is that uh, you don't have to think into the future, and you've also got multiple ideas, and you can also practice the creative process, right, in one session in different areas. So, you know, I can go from, um, not the day, because I'm focused on doing a lot of splurging, because I emptied the splurges out. Um, but what you'll have seen me do is I'll practice different areas of this. So, for example, I might do... Um, I might do some release stuff. There might be some release. So release, when we think of like uh, release, is very much the um, uh, convergent thinking. So, it's you know, when you're doing mixing, a lot of it can be a definite yes or no. Yes, have I done this? No, I haven't done this, right? You know, I'd, I'd reverb to the snare, gate it. Have I done this? No. Okay, do it. Yes. Okay. Just like that. So we can have these uh, concrete binary decisions made. Uh, lists that we can just tick off um, and obviously that continues throughout the machine um, you know even when I'm talking about the wins problems and opportunities when you're doing your opportunities right and you're coming up with solutions for things just as the same as making lists of how you're going to put move your music on forward you've got to make things um, concrete okay so for example you wouldn't say something like um, all right so uh Let's say, like, in Done, I came up with a problem, right? And the problem was make the bass groove more, all right? Or make the drums better, <laughs> okay? Make the drums better doesn't give you anything to do. I mean, what does make drums better mean, okay? So we need something that's a bit concrete. You need something to start with, okay? Even if it might be wrong, but you need something to, to do, okay? Because then it gets your brain fired and then you think of other things, right? So... For example, okay, something that's more concrete, right, would be um, <clears throat> something that's more concrete would be uh, for making the drums groove more, would be maybe push the second snare forward slightly and swing uh, every 16th on the hi hat. So that might get you somewhere into that kind of groove thing, but it gives you two actions that you can go straight into your session and do straight away. And if it works, great. And then that might lead on to other things, okay? By having these lists that you do in a session as well, which tends to happen after splurge, splurging, we don't necessarily have lists. I mean, we might have ideas or something or themes or maybe even a story at that stage, a possible purpose to hang off. Um, but in general, we want our um, we want all of our actions throughout the machine to be as concrete as we possibly can. I know it's creativity. I know things the things we're working on haven't existed yet, but there's no reason why 
the actions that we do can be, you know, focused and, and concrete. And of course, the wins, problems and opportunities, as I keep saying, is such a powerful tool to use in your guitar playing. But it just requires you to to look at yourself with what you're doing um, and, and be realistic and monitor your, your progress, you know. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're up for improvement, this is the way to do it, you know. Um, another thing to uh, have a think about as well is a great book called um, uh, Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler, and I've mentioned him before. It's like a series of books that I have that are, that are massively influential on me. And the Stephen Kotler thing, that book is just brilliant uh, because... I was I was in a flow research group for six months, right? And uh oh two seconds. <clears throat> I haven't got my hair light. I'm talking away and I haven't even set the studio there, that's better, isn't it? I was wondering why my hair didn't look very blonde. I have a special light for my hair. Sorry. Uh what was I saying? Uh, oh, Stephen Kotler, yeah. Uh, so, so um, he's a psychologist who you know researches flaws, isn't he? Um, and his stuff was really sort of influential because what it allows you to do. Nah. <laughs> the hair, yeah. Uh, right. Here's a question. Um, the logo isn't putting anybody off, is it? I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, when I put it up there, I thought, oh, God, I can't stop looking at the thing. But, like, now I'm all right with it. Anyway, so doing flow practice, I mean, what that was all about is just ways of actually just getting into the moment, okay? Now, and everything we want to do is we want to be in the moment because it's when we do our best work. We want to be in flow. And what's interesting is Stephen Collin, the other psychologist, Chicks and Mehow, state that, you know, you want to be uh, within a 4 to 7%. Uh, you want a 4 to 7% skill to challenge ratio. So what that means is when you do your actions, okay, on guitar and you're practicing, you just want to be between, I don't know how you measure this, right? but you just got to feel it out is uh you just want to be you want to have a four to seven percent challenge out of your out of your depth out of your comfort zone so this could equate to um, a metronome so finding where you're really comfortable playing a lick on a metronome and then just popping it up a few bpm so you feel you know slightly out of control i try to master that good ryan the the, the Excellent. So I've rambled quite a bit today, but I think it's like one of those things. Because um, I have this manifesto that I go through now and then. But I think it's really important because obviously like with what I'm doing here is uh, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. I'm trying to like write music um, and stream at the same time and give, although I'm sure it's like entertaining and watching me push buttons and stuff, right? Um uh, but obviously, I'm trying to give you guys uh, value as well. So it's nice to have a chat now and then, isn't it? And just tell you about um, what what's actually going on in the creative process of how I approach it and how like, I coach people. But what I will say is when you put all this together and you learn something like the machine, which will take you about eight weeks, when you do something like that, okay, it takes the pain of creativity away. I mean, it's always going to be a little pain, but like a lot of it, the stuff that, you know, tends to bother you, the common stuff, the, you know, that's gone. You know, the, the machine, as long as you practiced it, it's absolutely got you covered. You've got no worries. Uh, and you will churn tons of music if you want. You know, you'll have tons of it there. You'll always have something to work on. Especially um, if you're a guitarist, because I mean, sort of for me, luckily for me, uh, I've got a ton of stuff, right, uh, that I can just pull out and and jam on. I've got something for every day. Um, I can just play over. Um, when I'm doing live shows, there's always music there. And, um, when I'm when I'm doing the live shows with Thomas and I'm here, 
um, I'm the guy triggering the tracks off. And what we'll do is we'll we'll um, although I've been we haven't done this for a while. It is uh, I'll go through sort of the stuff that I've been working on and uh, pull stuff out quickly. Do a master on it. I mean, literally, you can just like uh, like e master or something like that. I'll just use that. Give it a quick master, and then bang it up in the live, and we'll just jam on it. Um, and that's really good actually having that because when you've got all this material, what it reminds me of is a bit like the same sort of vibe you get. Um, when I was younger and you'd sit and kind of write an idea in the house and then you go meet the band, you go to your rehearsal and then you go, right guys, I've got this idea and you all start kind of jamming on it and feeling it out. It's a very similar thing, you know, you kind of got these ideas that you can jam over and create other ideas. Uh, so there we go. And that's, um, I've talked for a bit there, haven't I? Now. I wasn't meaning to talk, but I'm like half waking up and this sometimes happens. I can't even remember how I got into all of that. Um, anyway, does anybody want to ask me anything about the creative process? Oh, Guitar Rob's here. Hi there. If you want to ask anything about... Sitting here and having to make music. I'm happy. Yeah, having <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But I, I think you know, um, there's been like lots of processes I've done in the past, and they've all been quite good, and I've all got you know, um, stuff out of it and being prolific but i think with the machine you know like straight away i mean the game changer was obvious that actually you know um even though it's just a load of columns right on trello um we're in a situation where we can work on multiple ideas at the same time, you can work on an album all at once. You you end up with an abundance of material. Um, and we've got to believe, and it is true, creativity is in abundance. We don't have to think, I've got to be in the mood of it. I've got to wait for, like, um, inspiration to hit. I mean, to me, that just doesn't happen. I don't, you know... Uh, I don't. I don't wait for this kind of random light lightning bolt of creativity to hit me. Right, <laughs> right. Better do some music. What? What if I'm in Sainsbury's pushing the trolley? Right, because this used to happen. Well, while the missus is like putting stuff, and then I'm in a dream state because like I've got to go somewhere else mentally to get through it. Right, she's going down the aisles and put, and then suddenly I'm like, oh, right, I've got it. I'm so excited. I've got to get home and inspiration. And you get home, and then there's no inspiration, and you're thinking, where did that go? <laughs> right. Oh right, well there we go. Right, Des, that's good. So, um, yeah. So, so thanks, uh, thanks for the shout out on Thomas's stream the other week regarding people helping your solos. All right, yeah. So, um, <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Sometimes you get edited, but you see, this is like one of the things, right? So. Um, and I think this is like one of the fun things. It just doesn't happen all the time. Um, uh, but it's going to happen again because I've got like loads of stuff, right? So when I've got to do guitar solos, right, uh, sometimes I might have a vague idea, which I'll do the night before, right? If I say, right, I'm going to do a guitar solo to everybody. Uh, so I knock a few ideas together and then, but I don't record anything, okay? Or I have no idea what I'm doing. And then I record it. So I think um, I've got a feeling be the one, be the one solo was like zero idea, right? So uh, that that was all recorded a hundred percent on this live on the live stream. So there I was, and uh, I mean I think I kept most of the audience, but you know you, you're subjected to me like messing up <laughs> and making horrendous noises. However. This is the cool thing you can do with a live stream when you're recording, uh, you know, recording music. You've just, you know, 
trust your audience that are there, okay, and bring them in to help you, okay, because it can help. Um, so Des is the, uh, he is the guitar uh, quality control officer. Think of like the, <laughs> think of like the, a council inspector coming around with a clipboard. And uh, he he has the uh, kind of, he's the sort of final say on things. So he's all ears, right? And then everybody else is, right? And then you record solos and then people can like comment on what's going on, what they think you could improve on. Um, And it's great. Or like even like uh, creative sessions add a bit more vibrato, do this, you know. So um, that was actually quite, quite, I felt that was quite a brave move for me, like recording solos, because really uh, I had the belief that like I couldn't do that or I wouldn't be happy with what I was doing on on the live and uh thanks for the help of everybody just exposing that feeling and those thoughts and like well we're in a situation creating a thing where I think right well we're all in a situation now uh we've got to do this thing but hey there's everybody else here and quite frankly um the, there's like loads of guitar experts there's people who play guitar, who've got their own guitar struggles, who are focused on doing various things that I'm doing. So uh, why not just like, you know. Plus, I love that idea of everybody having like that kind of a little bit of creative like ownership and helping. It's good. Because you get to produce, don't you? Okay, fair enough. You're typing on text. But is it that much different to like an old school producer would do? You know, that take was a bit flat. Do it again, you know. And then you've got the fresh ears things. And it and it's worked beautifully. So there's been numerous solos that I've there's been all of the solos that I've done, right? Have been that. There is a downside. So I've got I went from the belief of not being able to think that I would actually ever do anything live because actually i remember there was a live with thomas right and we decided to do that recording and i was just having one of those days and i just couldn't get my head around it and then we're recording solos and mine was just like a piece together lump of shit right (laughs) this was mint (laughs) and i was just like oh for fuck's sake this is like awful i'm never doing this again and then i thought luckily you know um you know i need to i need to do something a bit different on the live so let's uh you know let's um record some guitar and why record some guitar because it was it was becoming a fear and I thought right well what's fear right it's it's something you know if I can overcome this it would be a really good strength to have right so I just thought right well I've already kind of proved that I can not record a guitar solo so there's nothing really to lose so I might as well just see if I can do it and again it was wins problems opportunities but I used um everybody who was there with Des, with his clipboard, ticking the stuff off. Was that vibrato or wide enough? No, it wasn't. Tim, vibrato, redo the vibrato. Listen, everybody, shall I do the vibrato again? Yes. Okay, let's do the vibrato again. Is it now wide enough, Des? It is. Tick. And then I colour in each part green. And off we go. That's uh, it's a good thing. Uh, but fresh ears is important and also, you know, you can't always take in all of the detail of what you're doing. It's, um, you know, I've, I've sat there and done a guitar solo on my own and, and I uh, think this is a, like great and really focused on it and listened to it and thought, God, what kind of a mess is this? So that's it. And I mean, um, so getting over that fear of doing stuff and recording guitars, that, that went for the guitar solo thing. Um, <clears throat> which was a huge uh, power up for me, really. Um, I think the o- the only downside to it was um, now I don't like make music on my own. <laughs> I like to have people in the room with me, uh, so I like to go live. Um, and I know the guy who coached me; he had this as well. He was like, just like I want to do, wants to do everything live because it's really motivating when people are there. Um, especially when you get used to the idea of like, okay, you might just like mess things up and it might not be a very good session. Uh, but that's life. You know, you can't, I can't sit here and be super inspirational every single day. That's part of the challenge because this, this, 
coming here and watching me is like watching somebody in an office. They're going to have a good day and they're going to have a bad day. And this, this is what life is like, isn't it? It's not the best foot forward all of the time. Uh, so you do come out naked and you do think of ideas uh, to do and get excited about them and then do them and fall flat on your face. Um, but that's not a problem, is it? Because, um, hi there, BRS, how are you doing? That's not a problem because it creates problems. If we're creating problems, then, you know, um, we create new knowledge for ourselves, just like this whole solo thing and doing it live here. It created tons of problems, which, uh, with the help of you guys, I was to overcome. And I was to, it, it also made um, clear what I had to work on on guitar, what areas of technique needed to be improving, what I needed to do with my phrasing. Um, it defined... Um, <clears throat> It solidified the style that I was doing, you know, that kind of legato thing, that, that period, although I'm doing the economy picking thing now. Uh, I'm actually going, I'm now kind of fusing the two things together uh, in a more fluid sort of way. So I'm kind of coming out of the economy picking thing and adding this other thing, but then also doing a bit of hybrid picking, which is now finding a place in my plane, which I'm quite excited about. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's been it's been a bit of a, bit of a speech today right using the machine right so here's uh so z who um uh, basically uses the machine very effectively um so z i should say z um has well he's been practicing this machine for nearly a year now possibly a year and uh, he has done so much material and released so much stuff and the amazing thing about it is uh, everything that I've said is true um, and he's proved it all so I've watched Z's music grow and improve through this whole wins problems opportunities and just making music reviewing what you're doing understanding what you need to do or try next time doing it has it made an improvement yes we'll keep going and uh he's got so much material coming out i mean he'll just you know he'll have an album scheduled and then start like releasing like singles just for a laugh in between for something to do imagine being in that situation it's so exciting when you got music you know because um I mean, I don't release as much because um, I've done it all, right? And I want to, like something else now with this streaming thing, okay? So I do do it. Well, saying that, there was the album came out. There's a few new tracks on that. Um, but when I was pr like releasing a lot of a lot of music, it was an amazing situation to be in because I had something to reach out to anybody really. And uh, when I was releasing through other labels some of them like really decent and remember i charted seven times um I, I would send stuff and i would send them to multiple places and then you just see you just fish and see who comes back and then you do a release with them and it's an incredibly exciting thing to do it's just you're not going to make any money but what it will do is create opportunities for you so if you've got music there you can send it you've got something haven't you you've got something to play your guitar on you've got something to show the world uh, and it allows you to connect which is why I think of mixing, right, as not necessarily mixing a track. When you're finally at the end of that music machine, what are we doing when we're mixing? And why is it sometimes that we overjudge our stuff? And why do we find the mixing phase a problem? Why uh, does it, you know, encourage us to have that kind of perfectionist mindset, which we don't want? Okay, perfection it. You want you need to kill that one dead, right? Because nothing's perfect. Um, <clears throat> it's a fantasy. It's something we can work towards. It's like the horizon, and you can move towards it. But nothing can be a, like perfect. How can how can you make something perfect that everybody else objectively says in the entire world, right? That's perfect. It's you can't do it. You can work to objective perfection, but it's like the horizon. You you will, you know you'll you'll never you'll never ever get to it and i can't remember what i was talking about but oh yeah so what are we doing mixing um so one of the reasons that we find mixing um a problem and finishing is because we're not necessarily mixing what we're actually doing is we're connecting something to the outside 
So when I'm going through the machine, right, everything's sort of internal in here in this room. As soon as I go into the release phase, right, you've made the decision and now we're connecting to the outside world. And that's a totally different set of kind of muscles that we're using. And also, because of our prehistoric brains, right, kind of protecting ourselves because we still have a tribe mentality, okay? So with the tribe mentality, um, what you tend to do is you don't want to stick out too much from the crowd because you're frightened of getting kicked out. Uh, if you got kicked out of a tribe back in the day uh, when we were throwing spears, um, it meant certain death. So we do have this part of our brain that controls us, right, to not do things that are too, uh, you know, out there. So we remain in favour of the tribe, okay? And that that feeling is still there, that that mechanism. Um, <clears throat> and this is what can cause us, like, a lot of problems with that connection thing. Well, of course, music's never hurt anybody, has it? You're just giving something to the world. That's all it is. Um, so by thinking of it like connecting, connecting to the world, it kind of gives you a different, for me, it gives me a totally different perspective on what I'm doing and also allows me to accept those feelings that are there, but they're not necessarily true and to work through them. Um, I, my first, um, <clears throat> my first sort of like solo release I did, I think it was 2014. Um, so it was six months of just finding a style, finding a niche, and I was, I was doing Future House. I was a Future House artist, and it came. I had this track, and I felt, I felt that like, all right, this is, this is a good example of what it wants to be in terms of its genre. And I thought, well, might as well just send it out, and uh, I sent it out. And I remember I got, uh, it was something like five offers, and uh, most of them were really like decent labels. There were, um, and the one that I really liked who reached out to me was uh, Two Dutch, um, who were just a great, like, those guys are great, right? And they, they ended up managing me for two for two years. Um, <clears throat> and I learned so much, actually, as a producer, like, working with them. But anyway, um, I remember then them asking me for the track and me not sending it because I had this fear of like, oh, when I put it out there, what if it's awful? What if everybody hates it? What if uh, I can't be bored with all the hassle? I don't want it. But then I think, then what am I doing with my life? You know, if I'm not going to release it then. and But there was that struggle and I put it out there. Um, and then that was it. And that was the first first one. And then I thought, all right, that's, it's gone quite well. I might do another one. And uh, sure enough, that fear kind of went and then eventually I was just like banging any old tune out you know I was like I started getting into tech house there was a really fast turnover rate for doing that stuff which I really like because I got sick of doing all the kind of the thing is when you're doing like um well the problem is is when you're doing like sort of the future house thing because it's like technically it's EDM really isn't it so there's this almost perfection mindset anyway, so you do tend to overproduce things. So I was still going through all of that. And to get out of it, I started getting into um, like Tech House, where it wasn't so much based on the melody and the music and how perfect things were meant to sound. Uh, what it was about was it was about ideas. Uh, and so I became very focused on that, and it was brilliant because what I was able to do was do like an EP in a week. And then have that sent out. So then there was this like sudden spurt of doing three track, five track um, EPs on various various labels, which was brilliant. Uh, and I, w I was really able to understand and learn about this kind of what is quality and that quality threshold. Um, <clears throat> right. So it, yeah. Well. So creatively no longer as a roadblock for me yeah so a couple of things here so um see who's been practicing a while said creativity is no longer a roadblock for me that it used to be so that's a massive win okay um this one's interesting i'll just try and i'll just do add from it. it's just my own skill that's the limiting factor now well this is the thing right there are so many musicians right who i would say are or would consider themselves not skilled. Um, the word limiting is good, right? Okay, because where does creativity exist? 
creativity doesn't exist, right, in having 8 billion options to do something. Um, my com- my computer, my, my DAW is bloated with stuff, right? Okay, of like stuff people have, you know, um, plug-in companies have sent me to try out, subscription stuff, uh, about, you know, 90, 95% of it I don't use, right? And there's always just like certain tools that I'll go to, like today, because of yesterday's, the Juno 60 wasn't working, I've had to go back to a few tools, right, that I thought I was going to move away from. But then I realised, like, these things are good, right, because there, there are limitations, and I understand them. So when you think of limitations, think of this, right? Creativity lives in limitations. It's an absolute fact, okay? That creativity comes from those uh, from having limitations. That's when you start really thinking about what the possibilities of how can I make this thing different. And of course, I mean it's good, and we do want to have like really polished kind of mixes and stuff like that. And we can add skills, okay? Uh, but what I'd be aware of is your own musical identity and how a limiting factor can help that, because if you have limitations. It forces you down a certain way, okay? So I'll give you a really good example of this. Limit. Um, so I, you know, despite being technically a muso, right? Uh, <clears throat> from an early age, I was a raver, right? I was there. I was there in the raves, right? You would expect me to be in the front row of a rock gig, but that just wasn't the case with me. Uh, I, I was out. I was out, and at the time uh, in Sunderland, it was the Blue Monkey, and it was when rave was not necessarily like four on the floor at like 175 BPM, right? With us dressed in tracksuits, it wasn't like that at all. It was more like jungle and breakbeat. Um, you had things like Prodigy and all of that stuff. It was like that period um, when I was a young teen and uh, I used to go in the club, sneak in and have a great time. And um, listening to that music, I thought, a lot of it, like the chord stuff was really complicated and stuff like that. Or you listen to like one of the tracks, Joey Beltram's James Brown is dead, like something like that, right? So that has, um, it just had, and I remember that having, I thought like in a club, right? It's got these huge like orchestra stab things on it. And it used to just sound out of a PA epic to me. And I thought, God, he must be like this amazing composer thing, you know, uh, but no, it wasn't. It's just a sample off a record, a chord, right? That'll have been, it's just a minor chord that he's just used a minor chord and then tried to play it diatonically, but it doesn't diatonically fit because you've always got a minor chord and for it to fit diatonically, it would have to be a mix of major, minor, diminished, right? So there's none of that going, but he's inventing this almost outside chord progression by accident. Well, how did that happen? Well, it became from limitations. He doesn't know what that is. He put, he's not going to jam. He's not going to jam jazz over it. He just wants it to go, dun dun dun, doesn't he? Uh, and that's it. And it's like, does that sound good? Yes. So his limiting factor drew him to sampling stuff. I'll tell you another amazing thing that um, there's this guy who remakes dance tracks, and uh, one of my favourite tracks is uh, "Fluffy Clouds" by The Orb. Right. So if you listen to "Fluffy Clouds" by The Orb. It's got this great, and I think now, like even now, I love it, right? Um, so it's it's oh, it's got so many good things about it, but it's got this really cool delayed riff thing that sounds a bit jazzy, right? And I used to think it was a synth that they wrote it on a synth, and I think that's like amazing. And then it's the harmony it makes, right, with the backing music, just sounds great, right? Um, and I think, wow, how do you do chords like that? How do you think of a melody like that? They didn't. Do you know what they did? They sampled a Pat Metheny record, (laughs) stuck some delay on it, found a good bit that they liked, about like two beats of this thing, right? And I think they even had to edit the riff in a certain way, so they made a new riff out of it. And they just went by ear. And that was, they don't know jazz harmony. They don't know anything about, they just got this thing and went, you know what, I'll make it better for this. I'll just chop this bit, put that bit there, reverse that bit, do that, slap some delay, reverb on it. What does that sound like? Great put the bass line on, wow, that's amazing, and off it goes. But there are examples of limiting factors, you know, uh, of how you define a style. So this whole kind of dance sample-based music came from these guys, these producers, 
just having limitations and coming up with something profoundly new because I had never I'd heard rock bands and you know all that kind of stuff was going on shred and then suddenly I hear this stuff in a club and I think how are they how do they do that and that's what the first thing that sort of drew me into the whole kind of electronic um music making thing was the diversity and the fact that you know how you can um you don't become limiting you don't become limited as long as you give yourself limitations is what i'm saying (laughs) all right i should be splurging today shouldn't i but i'm talking i hope this is okay guys i'm on for one of my um uh, this is a lecture (laughs) Oh dear. Actually, Gramsci is still there. Thanks for the comment. I never saw myself as... Well, I do have a dry sense of humour. Um, but I'm probably quite serious today. Talking about music. It's good stuff. That's good. Interesting stuff, yes. Like Sometimes I feel like I'm repeating myself. Um, but... <laughs> It's such a, uh, when it comes to creativity, it's like, you know, this is, this is the core stuff that I think gets ignored. You know, this is the important stuff that, that, that has to happen, uh, or is happening before we start making a noise, before we start picking guitars up and doing stuff, you know? <laughs> Excellent, say. That's brilliant. Um, you know, it's all, it's all essential stuff. Uh, and, um, you know, why, you know, I can't keep it to myself. I need to talk about what I'm going through in the process because I know for a fact what I'm going through is what a lot of people are going through. Um. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so, so um, I've had inspiration by watching and listening to guitarists of certain style, then all of a sudden coming up with stuff. Brilliant, yes. And that's because we're priming our subconscious with ideas. Yeah, so it is different. Yes, yeah, so there's different angles, and the reason for that is because all the time I'm having different experiences, um, and also uh, like I coach a lot of people during the week. So I've got like my coaching group, and then I'm like coaching for the guy who coached me, which is Mike. Um, so the good thing about this is, and this is the real thing, is uh, it's got good grounding. Okay, I see what I see people having the same issues and I see a lot of things being being solved the same way. The interesting thing though with like the coaching thing, although it's like what I do is not strictly um non directive, there is a directive thing about it. So like if I'm doing like um if I'm do this is the good thing about like so because I always mention coaching, and coaching is like a thing. Like the, it's, it's a bit of a but. Like if you're a coach, it's something a bit different, and it's like more hierarchical in a way, uh, which I suppose it is in terms of like the educational ladder. So if we think of it like um, in value, like the, the how much money people get paid, right? So we will have teaching, okay, um, mentoring, consulting, and then coaching, okay. Um, so if we think about it, like teaching is like a skill focus. It's like, I'm going to open your head and you it can actually teaching can be, you know, you can do, you can do all of these things really. Um, but I'm talking about them in the, you know, if we separate them out, right. And we just look at each one. So like teaching your, your, well, what you're doing is you're installing new skills. Okay. You're giving people new skills, which is fine. Okay. Um, and then we get to, uh, by the way, I'm going to have to do a morning live tomorrow because I'm just going to talk on this one. 
Um, so we've got teaching, you're installing skills, right? Um, then we've got the, the mentoring thing, which is where you allow somebody in your studio and it's like, well, this is how I do it. You watch, right? And then just, you know, what you can get out of this, this is how you do it, right? So you show them a way that's kind of live and practical for the situation that you're in. Okay, it's not in theory, it's the next level up. Um, you've got consulting, which is giving you the information and suggestions of how you can move yourself on further. Okay. And then we've got coaching. Now, what coaching is, and this is why it's brilliant, right, and why I like it, is what you're doing is you're helping somebody, you're, you're facilitating, firstly, the skills that are already there. You're not, you, what you're not doing, right, is you're, you're not, um, you're not installing more skills, okay? You're getting the person to use the skills that they have already got okay, to solve the problems that they need to f solve, and that's what it is. And usually, uh, in its purest form, um, the coach won't tell you anything, okay? They'll only ask you questions, right? So, and all of the work is coming from the person that you're coaching. But the skill is, is there's a certain way of asking questions, okay, for it to, for it to work, really and there's certain things you don't do. And then what happens is, eventually that person will have a problem, they'll come into a session, and then they'll come up with something they can do and get very excited about it and then want to go off and kind of do it. But it's all on their terms, okay? Now, the aim of it is, uh, one of the things that you'll find in coaching is um, people will get stuck. All right, hold on. I'm just going to show you something. Uh, uh, let's have a look here we go zones of experience <laughs> so here's a model right oh god right what hey sorry um so <clears throat> Oh my god, right, I've gone into lecture mode now. What started this? What did we, like, where, how, like, I, I got up, right, and I was going to do some splurging. I got up, I, I, I was dreaming about Kiesel guitars, right, and, like, uh, some sort of wood-type finish, uh, and then, and then, like, splurging, and then, like, how, you know, I'm going to get to 21 splurge, and then I've ended up here. With zones of experience, right? But let, anyway, let's let's just have a look at the inside of this mental map. So, for example, what what you'll find and you'll discover in somebody is uh, they they lose connection with what their purpose is. Okay, and the purpose is is what you what are you trying to do in the world? What what is the thing that you're going out? Why are you doing what you're doing? Okay, but then what you'll find is uh, I'm sure we can all relate to this, and it's the story I always tell, is uh, capabilities. People get stuck in capabilities, and I do see this with guitarists as well, okay, and producers, okay, this uh, how do I do this skill, knowledge and abilities. So people will feel that they don't have enough skills to do the thing that they're doing. Oh, there we go. Excellent said. So Tim has mentioned, uh, I'm in the coaching, but at this point, I'm good with using the machine on my own. Excellent. Uh, which he is, he's an expert. Um, but the expertise helps solve problems and push forward, and the group keeps me accountable, yeah. And of course, like, um, it's forever changing as well. Uh, the landscape of coaching, the world around us is changing. So, uh, it's not like a curriculum. The coaching thing's dynamic. It's dynamic to the world around us. <clears throat> um, and I'll give you a great example. So uh, when I'm talking about the... the um, so I have two coaches, all right? So there's Mike who coaches me. And then I have um, this other 
occupational therapist lady who's a trained coach, right? Uh, not in music, but everything else. And um, when we're in the situation of the pandemic, right? So I'm sure you guys know that um, when the pandemic hit, because like I work in the NHS, the health service here in England, um, I was classed as, uh, it was an essential specialist. It was a letter came through the door. So uh, I had to go to work, okay? So I was like... Um, it was like it was like being thrown on the on the front line. The thing with me is the way my job works. I was like, normally you do three shifts and then you're off or whatever. Uh, but I was there like in every day on on different units across uh, sort of my county. Okay, and uh, the risks at the time when we didn't really know about it felt quite high, and um, everybody was anxious. You know, we're watching it on the news, and when that pandemic hit, it was like. Oh, like this is like real it's very scary people you know potentially are gonna die um could be me could be you you know so there was that fear getting on till we all sort of got used to the thing um so there was me and this occupational therapy and what we did is we coached ourselves through it because i still wanted to have momentum i still wanted to be doing my music i didn't want to live in fear and uh but coaching helped me set just other life health goals I used it to set up uh, my regular sessions. I used it to eventually set up this channel with like decent lighting and, and mess up, you know. So I used that coach and really, really helped me move on. And that's a great example of coaching being dynamic to the world around us. Anyway, so what will happen is people lose their connection. So where we want to be is we want to be aiming for this, the meaning of our lives. What am I doing this for? What is the purpose, right? What, what value are you giving to the world? What value are you giving to your families, right? What value are you giving to yourself, right? What's your mission, okay? And then what will happen is we'll get, like, stuck on things like this. So the skill thing will happen, like, loads, right? Uh, I was completely and utterly skill-focused as a young shred guitarist, right? For some reason, I thought, right, that uh, if I could play, like, Paul Gilbert uh, with a few tracks, right, uh, that the world would snap into line around me and I would be super successful. Uh, that wasn't the case, was it? But I used to sit there for a while and I remember going, right, well, I need to be able to play like three notes per string in every position, in every key, uh, in every combination of <laughs> notes, right? And although that kind of, I didn't achieve it, right? So I failed, uh, although I did get to play a lot, you know, it did help me with my technique, but it was almost impossible to do. And just stopped me from being creative. It stopped me from having a voice. So when I was doing that, I was skill focused. I was saying I'm not ready. Uh, and again, this is like feeling that limitations are a bad thing. I felt that like, you know, uh, I can't be successful unless I conquer these certain things. Uh, the knowledge thing, I don't know enough theory. Well, actually not knowing theory can actually help you. Look at all these successful electronic producers. They don't know loads. They'll not even know what a mode is. Um, and abilities, yes, just your skill range, the abilities. All of these things people people get stuck on. And when you're coaching somebody, you're asking them questions, right, in a way that bumps them up this map, okay? So you're just trying to move them onto something else and to get them to think about what it is they're doing. And then eventually you, you're getting their ideas and their actions to always connect to the purpose. So you're always trying to do the things on the lower level, you're trying to connect them with the higher level. So this is made up of, you've got your connection, you've got environment, you've got behavior, you've got capabilities, you've got cognition, you've got pers uh, perspective, and you've got identity. Okay, so I might as well just, as I'm talking about this coaching thing, go through these because they are sort of important. So capabilities, as we know, are skills, right? Behaviors are very important. So if you think about my behaviors, right? One of the things that keeps me consistent is this live. And again, you know, um, having you guys, this this small uh, community of people who are interested in what I'm doing and also getting stuff out of it for themselves. Um, having this holds me accountable. I, I book a live session on and I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to do it. And it's what I needed because like my morning sessions that I was doing on my own were getting patchy. I needed another challenge. I needed to be uncomfortable to get comfortable again, to get motivated. And this is why um, I do the live thing, because I knew it would help me form a business, and it would also help me um, 
write music. Okay. Uh, and it would also help me, uh, it would bring back the fear again. So as a coach, I'd be able to experience that and then work out my own strategies, which I can share with everybody else of how I overcome that, that jump into the unknown and that fear. Um, so behavior is all about, you know, this for me, it's about, you know, getting up, turning up at the same time and doing a session. So I have a minimum viable studio session every day, um, that I do, that I have to do, um, as if my life means on it. So I'm not here. I'll still splurge over the weekend, but there'll be five, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes I'll do a big studio session, uh, but I'm creating every day and Monday to Friday, um, everything goes well you know, I'm being held accountable by you guys. The other thing is your environment. Think about your environment. What isn't serving you? I had, there's a keyboard here. That's my splurge, by the way. Uh, I had that slightly pushed too far away from me, so I wasn't using it, but I didn't realize this. And I thought, hold on a minute, just pull the keyboard forward and get it there. Having guitars in cases, why have a guitar in a case, right? Uh, you should have it out next to you in arm's reach. So you're picking it up. It's not even, you're not even conscious and you're picking the thing up and you're playing it plectrums at the ready things laid out that you need things that you don't need put in a cupboard if you're not using it don't have it and i'll tell you why it's like a cognitive load uh, other things are having notifications on phones with the red dots they put a cognitive load on you it makes your brain making decisions under the subconscious it ends up that your phone rules your life and you're not ruling your life one of the most important things we have to practice as a musician is to be proactive and not reactive because that's when you just lose control of your career that's where you're a skills focused person playing skills and hoping that this magic manager comes along and makes you successful well that's not going to happen and even if it does it would probably be horrible anyway because you'd be being reactive to someone else and there's plenty of stories about musicians actually and really good guitarists who've ended up in that situation being reactive and being unhappy okay and then breaking out the mold and doing their own thing and then becoming happy again and not necessarily having the money and wealth uh, but it happens more often than not um so what fundamentally what we're trying to do is we're trying to build habits, aren't we? And habits is just something that we automatically do. If you think about going to the gym, when you get into that groove of the gym, when you miss the gym, you think, oh, you know, you feel a bit weird, so you don't want to miss it. So developing habits is something that you can focus in on. And it's based around, um, you know, uh, having a trigger and having a reward. So there's a trigger for me. I, I always get up in the morning, for now at least, uh, and that's the trigger. And then there'll be a reward as I get to chill out, I get to do my wins opportunities, get to see the, the child and missus and have a cup of coffee and just chill for a bit. That's the reward. Um, so we covered environment. So like making sure you've got all the gear that you need and the stuff that you don't need. It would be better for you to work in limitations than it would be to have absolutely tons of like options okay which is why thomas's plugin is absolutely amazing because it's limitations what's thomas saying he's saying this is all you need so just take that as the gospel that's all you need for your guitar from now on and make the best out of it because that's how you're going to come up with something more unique is like working with these tools and finding the blind spots and areas and combinations that other people haven't uh but then not overwhelming yourself all right then so what else have we got? We've got cognition. Cognition's like one, I mean, they're all like amazing things to work in. Cognition's one of my favorite ones. So this is all about um, making decisions, okay? And when we're making decisions, it's we're, we're looking at insight and analysis, all right? So that whole thing of insight, when I mentioned the Sainsbury's, shopping in Sainsbury's, an insight happens. And then what happened in that story is I went home and then I didn't have insight, okay? I had no inspiration. So therefore, I felt like I can't do the session because the, the magical lightning bolt that I needed isn't there. So whatever I was thinking was absolute shit, right? Well, that's not right. Okay. Inspiration happens. And what you have to do is you have to remember it, write it down because there are some truths in that. Inspiration comes from, uh, usually, it, well, it, it has to come from somewhere. So it comes from you, uh, trying to solve analytically a problem. So you might've been stuck and then suddenly the solution to a problem, your brain's working on it in the subconscious, and then suddenly this thing will pop up in your head, right, randomly, and you'll get all excited about it. Uh, there is some truth in the matter, and what you have to do is remember these things, take it back to the studio, and ruthlessly act on it because it's a good starting point, um, and, and believe in that inspiration. It's not airy-fairy. It actually comes from a place that 
that exists, all right? It comes from a, a possible solution of a problem that you've been solving that's been going on a while. So that's what I'd say about insight and analysis. Also, insight's the flow, isn't it? It's about, when I was mentioning Stephen Kotler, and I didn't quite get to that, his looking at his 17 conditions of flow and then using uh, what you, and then trying to come up with things, whatever you experience in flow, trying to come up with little games to get you in flow, like the preconditions of flow. So for me, the big one for me that I always prefer is the timer. I always try and beat the clock because there are consequences there. I've got to beat the clock. Um, so that tends to get me very, very focused. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so and then we've got your values and beliefs. I mean, there's like plenty of like weird uh, and wonderful beliefs that I've had about the industry. You know, everybody's out to get you and rip you off and all this kind of stuff, right? And there's certain stuff, or I have to have these skills before I do stuff, okay? Or uh, what, what my belief was, um, I can't, Tim can't, Hutch can't write a solo that he'll actually keep on a record on a live stream. So there's a great example. So how did I, how did I get rid of that belief? How did I change that belief? Basically an experiment. I think of like everything I do as an experiment. I don't emotionally get tied in with it as like, you know, I mean, there is an emotional connection with your music, but I, I don't see my music as a part of me. So if it fails, it doesn't drag me down. I'm just moving on to the next thing. It's just something I've made. Like the guy who made the Dyson Hoover, it's like, there it is, it exists. So oh, it doesn't work, breaks down, need to do a few alterations, all right, and then make it work again. That That's all it is. Uh, and so that belief was to do something live and to do a series of experiments, get new guys to help me, get me to prepare in certain ways or not to prepare and just work out and to observe what that fear is and how to overcome it. And I learned a huge amount of that because I was aware as a coach of the process I was going through. And I knew by doing this, I would end up with uh, valuable insights that I could give to you guys. Uh, so you've got to use yourself as an experiment and, and see what you're doing with your music as an experiment and your practice and all of that kind of thing. You're just seeing, you know, what happens if I do X? Um, and your identity. Uh, who am I? When am I doing this? Who do I want to be? And what is your vision? So there's another thing. It's like, you know, what what is our... Just being able to um, look at what your interests are your your unique qualities that you can put into your music we are all different okay and what we don't want to be doing is writing music that because we're inspired by this person i just want to do music that sounds like that person because there is so much of that um and i'm really aware of it like in guitar land as well i mean i, I don't know why like guitar is like very similar to the dance thing it's like people will jump on a style you know and it's just a little hammer it and then it's just a question of it all it all sounds i mean there'll be good tunes and there'll be bad tunes but it's it's all sonically sounding the same to me all right there's like nobody's jumping out of being like who's the best i couldn't tell you with a lot of like instagram players who's better than who it's just different variations of the same thing that that uh one will i might like a little bit better than the other depending on what my mood is of the day um, but there is absolutely nothing grab me by the balls and throw me across the room. That's for sure. But it's all technically amazing and the, and extremely well played by people who are so talented. Um, but I think this is why I like electronic music because sonically I can make something, I can have, a, I can find a sound and that person hasn't got that sound. Therefore, at least it's got that amount of difference. Um, tell me if I'm being too harsh here. And then finally, we've got the connection, the connection to our purpose. Or what are we doing? You know. Yeah, it's the shredding thing. Yeah, it's the shredders. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just a thought there. Sorry. Uh, but connecting. So what, what is our true purpose? Okay. So why are we doing what, what are we doing? Well, I love coaching, you see, and there's this very strong thread of um, kind of doing what I'm doing, but then people, uh, and it, this kind of accidentally happened, right? And then people benefiting from it, and then I became quite aware of that, hence me being um, a music coach, all right, uh, full time. 
All right. So, um, I have what's called, um, oh, what do we call, um, an authentic core experience. And it's almost like a mission statement that is a thread through everything that I do. And mine is, and I'll probably finish this, uh, based on pretty much myself, right? As a young, greasy, spotty teenager with shit hair like the karate kid, but like I was trying to grow it long and there was bits hanging out and like, like no girls would like me or anything like that. It was just like horrible, right? Uh, I wasn't too spotty, but there were spots and it was just generally just not a great time. Hated school, all that kind of thing, right? You're a bit teen, you don't know what's going on with your body, you're a bit uh, depressed, right? <laughs> all of that kind of thing and uh you you think it's just you in the world on your own okay so uh an authentic core experience is what it's about is it's about your purpose what you're doing in the world is you're trying to serve the world by um understanding or picking an area that's a problem state and moving it to a desired state so i just thought well me as a teenager because there's like lots of teenagers it's like that what i want to do is i want to move somebody from a state of isolation to aspiration and that's what i want my music to do so the kind of music serves that it draws people in hopefully um, they're inspired by it, but inspiration's all right but what do you do with inspiration or hope or things like that it's a bit the yeah, but aspiration's more concrete, isn't it? And I always think about um, going to see other bands to play, or, you know, at the time I was, you know, when, when I first heard Yingli Manstein play, that was absolutely amazing, and, and, and I was immediately triggered into uh, action by hearing him. I thought, you know, because the first one was Michael J. Fox on ba- Back to the Future watching him play, because I thought, right, well, that's what I need to do to get popular right but now i can do johnny be good like i need more than that that's all right you know uh to kind of get accepted in a tribe but i really want to like i want to be a tribe tribe leader right so yingwi mattenstein was the guy and uh like hearing him triggered uh this aspiration and even more so i remember seeing him play live and we've all experienced this as a guitarist going to see an amazing guitarist who you love and then coming home with your ears ringing and immediately not going to bed and playing your guitar and trying to remember what was going on, trying to figure it out. That's aspiration. So moving somebody from a state of isolation to aspiration is a big thing, isn't it? So it's what I'm doing with coaches, and it's what I do um, with people who are unwell. And it's in my music as well. So, you know, dynamically, I'll start, if you listen to the music I've done with Rockland and Hutch, you know, that music will start um, from a place small, and it'll grow. And it'll become big. It's telling a story, isn't it? And at the end, uh, it's the aspiration, isn't it? There's the drop you have, the purpose follows this uh, core, authentic experience. So there we have it. Uh, I don't know what kind of triggered me into all of this, um, but I, I think I've talked quite a bit. And I think it would be good if if anybody's got any questions. I have got seven minutes to answer anything so if anybody's got anything that would like to share after hearing me speak all of that quickly to type that isn't too long-winded um uh and i'll have to rename this live as like a lecture (laughs) part one um Thanks, Gramps. Lots of great thoughts you're having. Um, And keeping it rolling. The book of... I should do a book. Now, but this is the thing, right? Okay, and I'll probably mention it. I have severe dyslexia. (laughs) But I could write a book, couldn't I? I could just talk into Otter or something. I thought about... But I'm so busy with guitars and stuff. I even thought about... Uh, and I did toy with the idea, and I was nearly going to write. What what I have is, uh, in case I ever get broke or skinned, I have I have two PhD. Um, I have two PhD proposals 
that I'll put into universities for funding now and then just to see what's happening. And I usually get a little bit of interest, but then I don't, I tend to like not follow it up. Um, like one of them is actually about a, a black minority ethnic music project I ran for five years, right? Um, predominantly it had um, a lot of young people who were from the Muslim community. Um, so there's like one on that. And then there's one on the other side of what I did is when I did my master's, uh, I was looking at the kind of deconstruction of music, right, through found sound. Uh, in other words, I was a sound artist. So I did a master's in uh, experimental composition. Okay, <laughs> very geeky, but very good uh, because it kind of got me out of um, just the normal humdrum of uh, writing music diatonically and being stuck with things. It was stuff that was outside of that. All oh, right, yes, the wife, she would love to do that. I can see many, I mean, I could do. I might just pay somebody, though. I can see the arguments happening there. Because you just, who's going to understand this? I think this is your ego, Tim. I'll be like, no, no, seriously, that, like, you know, people are digging it. <laughs> but she'd be good, because she is an academic. Um... So I tend to do, like, I do put, like, a couple of, I've got a couple of proposals. So I thought about with the, um, not with the machine, but actually this whole creative process is exploring this idea of creativity being modularized. So I love the idea of this modular thing where basically we've got the, the divergent convergent process, right? We're aware of that and it's chopped up into different sections and, um, looking at each section of that. So in here, it's like, we could call it something else, but splurge, discovery, draft, um, done, release, right? So you can chop these, you can, you can chop these things up. And I think it would be nice to see what I'd be interested in is it's creativity. It's not, you know, I'm using it in music because that's what I do, but this, this should work, uh, across the board, you know, if you're if you're writing a book, right, then actually I would, you know, technically I would use this process to write a book because uh, I'd be splurging chapters, wouldn't I? And then chapters would be moving through the machine, I suppose. Um, so, Grams, you, oh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to use this, like, add to broadcast button. It's good, this, right? Uh, I feel like a big time when I do this. Uh, um you did make me realize a lot of personal crap was hanging over my creativity, like a dark curtain. Yes. Uh-huh. And we don't need to necessarily bring that in the room with us, you know. What we need to do is we need to focus in on the music. Anything that's like self-want, that critical self, we don't need. Um, so, Gramps, if you're wondering where I get the self-one, self-two thing from, there's this a marvelous book called The Inner Game of Music, and I think everybody who's on, on who watches my stuff, mandatory... I should put the reading list actually in my in my description. Uh, should read uh, the inner game of music. Uh, another really nice book to read actually is the Victor Wooten um, uh, music teacher. I mean that's just a great read, and I like that. I like that just for a bit of fun because it's a story, right? But it's incredibly insightful, um, and always massively helps me. But the inner game of music for practical stuff, it's great. Yeah. Um, I decided to, uh, you know, start learning economy picking. And then, like, I got into all sorts of trouble. And actually, inner game of music principles got me through the whole thing very, very quickly. Uh, I, uh, I haven't been an economy picker for very long. Um, so yes, and but I, I, it was a rapid progress when I put my head down it and I practiced this stuff. Wins, problems, opportunities. I'm able to. I now consider myself an economy picking person, to be politically correct. So there we go. Um, so I think we're. You know. Uh, I've talked, which is pretty good. I've talked for the whole nearly an hour and a half. Which is pretty good. It's been like therapy for me, to be honest. Oh, God, that feels good. Uh, all right. Well, because like I've talked and, um, <clears throat> but it was important. 
Um, it also gives everybody, you know, the you know a good a good insight into how I you know think of the world in terms of music, how I create music as an artist, and and how you know with my actual core experience, uh, what I'm doing is tied into everything else that I do externally, helping people. And in terms of a lecture that wasn't planned, I hope that was okay and wasn't too shoddy. I think there was some times I meandered off there. I should have planned it, shouldn't I, with a flashy PowerPoint. <laughs> and I've drank loads. I've held this coffee cup the whole time um, and I haven't spilt any of it on me, which is also an achievement. And I will be doing wins, problems and opportunities actually on this because... Um, I've never really. Uh, it's good. I've, I, you know, I've talked for like an hour and a half, which is uh, definitely a very good thing, and it's a skill, isn't it? Talking, and that's another thing that I've learned. You know, to talk. I think the only thing with me is, um, I, I, I find it difficult to just do anything outside music. It's like business only with me. It's like you know, I'm all ears for that, but then I can't like do like if I, I struggle with the fun stuff. I can't like like Thomas is really good at that, isn't it? He's like he's like when we're doing that live, he's essential social glue. <laughs> Whereas I don't have that, I'm just like, right, we'll sit in silence. <laughs> uh so I don't you know, there's no strategies for that. It's either this or you know, fall flat. Yeah. All right, guys. So, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I think, right, I'll rename. Oh, what shall I call it? Right, so I call this Splurge Part 6, right? What shall I call this live? Because I think it's an important one. People may want to go back to it. Um, I've got the the creative process talk. Hey, sure, I could do a TED talk. That would be good, wouldn't it? That would get me. That would be a like a good thing. The vocal splurge, yeah. You can do vocal splurge. The guy, coach splurge, yeah. The guy who actually uh, to oh, you see this might be another thing that might interest you. See, is uh, and I'll talk about it actually later. But I'll give you the insights he's got because he started singing. And he's done it in a way that's massively helped him. Tim Talk. Yeah. That's what I'll call it. Tim Talk. All right. Okay. Tim Talk. The creative process. That's what I'll call it. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'll... Right. So I am going to... I always say this, but it's the weekend. I am going to have to get up. If I'm going to hit my goals, right, I'm going to have to get up on Saturday uh, there isn't a live stream with Thomas, so I could go to bed early on Saturday night. So why not? I will see you guys, and I'm making the commitment now. I'm going to get up tomorrow, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do the stream, but I'm going to like heads down. I'm going to hit this target that I've made. Yeah, the new custom pro Kiesel Strat. Yeah. Well, there's one I'm looking forward, Mark, to the one that's going to be that's that's being built. Black raw tone, Osiris. Uh, it's going to look lethal. <laughs> it's the lethal guitar. Um, so it's going to be like the new the new go to, um, and it's got it's obviously got like favorite pickups in it. It's got the uh, Fishman McRocklin ones, very good. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that five way switch. Um, and it'll look black and it'll look mean. And I'll I'll not be able to wear this top because I'll not be able to see it. Um, but I'm already excited. I'm already losing weight, ready for my guitar. I can't lose weight for the missus, even though she calls me fat. Uh, but for a guitar, a new guitar, I've got no problem about going on a diet, 16-8 fast, 24-hour fast on a Monday, and I'm running every other day. And I'm slimming for my guitar. No pick guard. Just wood. 
raw, it's raw tone. Yeah, very good. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow then. All right then, bye.